Dave Schumacher in our Space Center in New York can tell us about it. David? Walter, as you'll recall, there was a certain smugness among American officials in the early days of space flight when Russian cosmonauts were suffering upset stomachs and ours were not. We were told it was because our astronauts and our training procedures were better. Then came Apollo and sickness on three straight flights, forcing American officials to look for some other explanation. First it was the flu, then sleeping pills. Now it is finally admitted our astronauts are suffering motion sickness because they're moving around in larger spacecraft. In short, pretty much the same reason the Russian cosmonauts did several years ago. Tom Stafford has had his crew flying aerobatics and jet planes, hoping that will help. We asked John Young and Gene Cernan if they thought it would. I think that you can condition your, uh, your equilibrium senses. Now, this, uh, I'm not a doctor, and this intuitive feeling that, that uh, adapting to motion sickness, if, if that's what ha the problem is, is a, is a thing that we can do. Uh, head movements in specific ways that tend to disorient you can, uh, can improve your capability to uh, stand motion sickness. But I've always thought that people who did a lot of acrobatics in airplanes were less likely to be motion sick. I spent a year on a destroyer, uh, which is sort of a motion sickness machine if, you, if you've ever been on one, and uh, I didn't get sick. Well, of course, flying, uh, we do a great deal of flying, and a lot of it is just straight and level, and we're all old fighter pilots of one sort or another, and it's nice to get upside down and sideways and pull some high G-force loads. And I think that'll help us, yes. That'll, that'll, that'll tune us up a little bit. But I, I think the main factor um, in this, in this uh, orientation problem that we've seen in Apollo uh, is the fact that it is a bigger spacecraft. We can now, now move around. And what we have done, I think, is take advantage of our forerunner's experience is to be aware that this can really happen and uh, and be waiting for it to happen and uh, I think a little knowledge a little awareness will go a long way and three of us having flown before hopefully uh, won't have any problems once they're up the astronauts today plan a series of simple head movements up and down and side to side hoping that will acclimate the sensitive inner ear to weightlessness and the resultant queasiness mostly though motion sickness is something doctors admit they can't really prevent. On the other hand, they can't really predict it either, and so they're hoping they'll be lucky with Stafford, Young, and Cernan. Walter? David, that business of moving their heads around on the exercises prescribed by Dr. Barry, uh, right to the threshold of illness, uh, sounds to me a little bit like that business of taking the cold tablet an hour before you feel the cold coming on. Uh, it may work, but it also has a certain uh, built-in danger to it, I should think. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. Less than a half hour now to the launch of Apollo 10. The countdown has reached T minus 28 minutes and 45 seconds. With me here at our CBS News Space Center at the Kennedy Space Center uh, is the distinguished historian and science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, an old friend of mine I am very honored to say, the man who, among other things, uh, wrote that uh, very exciting movie, 2001, although we're not here to plug movies today, nor books, uh, Mr. Clark, sir. <laughs> we're here to talk about the mission of Apollo 10. And uh, I'm wondering what you see. It was you followed space longer than almost anybody, except uh, maybe the uh, first rocketeers. Uh, I, I think uh, you've written about it. Uh, your projections have come terribly true. And you were telling me that eight years ago you made a bet that the first moon landing would be in May of this month. Uh, ten years ago, yeah. yes. I just ten lost years. the bet by about three months. <laughs> well, that's pretty close ten years ago, and no, no, very few of us were dreaming of that. What do you think the significance of Apollo 10 is? Well, you know, it's as if we're at Kitty Hawk now in 1900 and say about November 1903, and the Wrights are just playing around with their airplane, and we're trying to anticipate what importance this is going to be, and accept that this is more important, probably, than the conquest of the air. But it, t it depends on your, the time scale you take. In the long run, the conquest of space is going to be much more important than the conquest of the air, because after all, the airplane only took us to places we'd already been to. But what's happening now, we're going to go to new worlds. Wouldn't the Wright brothers be uh, more comparable to uh, going back to Shepard and uh, Gagarin's flights and John Glenn's first orbital flight? Uh, haven't we kind of reached the uh, Boeing, uh, uh, well, maybe no. the DC-3 stage? No, we haven't reached that. The, the, you're right, uh, the people you mentioned are more comparable perhaps to Lilienthal and the um, 
first gliders. And we won't get to the DC-3 stage until we have reusable spacecraft that we can fly over and over again, just like commercial aircraft today. They don't have to be thrown away in a single launch as they do at the moment. DC-3, of course, we're talking about was that workhorse of World War exactly. II in the aircraft area, the really first uh, major transport aircraft, I suppose. The uh, uh, Well, now, just last uh, week, we flew supersonic for the first time the uh, the land lander, the land uh, spacecraft uh, uh, out at Edwards Air Force Base, I believe, the spacecraft that will be able to come back from a space mission, a space yeah. taxi, and land on the land and be used again. This is the way space travel has got to develop. We have to make it a regular routine thing, and we have to develop a spacecraft which can an enter and land anywhere, and particularly can land on land. This business of landing in the sea is such a constraint. And as you know, the Russians, in fact, do come down on land, which must simplify their operations enormously. Partly, though, because of, they've got a lot more land to come down in uh, undeveloped areas, and and another, and their launch azimuth from where they launch, they really almost have to come down land, don't they? Or they'd be really way off. Uh, no, they could come down in the sea. In fact, it would be more convenient in some ways right. from the energy point of view. I, though I hate to get into this, that's some yeah, it's a little complicated. Yes, <laughs> uh, uh, Arthur, tell me what you foresee now. You've been terribly accurate in your predictions so far. What do you see in the rest of this uh, 20th century in the next uh, 30 years? Well, we're going to see the, the moon being opened up in the way the Antarctic has been opened up in this century, with the establishment first of unmanned bases, instruments being set up which can radio back to Earth. And then I hope within this decade, say within the 1970s, I hope you'll see the establishment of permanent bases with, with men there on the moon all the time and relieved from time to time by flights from Earth. And then I think that towards the end of this century, we'll be considering major permanent operations. In other words, the setting up of quite large bases, which eventually will grow into full-scale colonies. But of course, this depend the rate of which this happens depends on how fast we locate lunar resources, which can be exploited when we get there. And what about the manned orbiting laboratories, what we do with sort of inner space? Well, that is perhaps in the short run even more important because these uh, manned laboratories in space and observatories are going to enable us to exploit near space for many terrestrial uses, for meteorology, for communications, and above all, for discovering new resources on this planet, resources of land and sea. And there's a gigantic industry going to develop in near space in the next few decades which will do so many things for us here on Earth that we'll be unable to imagine how we ever managed without this kind of facility. The environmental uh, survey was, uh, has been going on for some time, and yes. it's almost taken a back seat to the more dramatic manned flights. But as you say, there's probably nothing more important than that. Uh, with infrared and other photography, we'll be able to see how crops are growing, how where mineral deposits are, exactly. uh, food uh, potential of the sea, million uses there. Yes, the, the Earth resources satellites are so important. That there are some areas in this where you can predict with considerable accuracy the investment of a single dollar will bring back 50 or 100 dollars within a relatively few years. In, in um, meteorology, of course, is already happening. But in discovering new mineral resources, oil resources, and in opening up areas of the sea which are much more fertile than the areas we're already exploiting. Well, there is some criticism, and perhaps some justified criticism, of spending $24 billion on the Apollo program right now to reach the moon, when there are so many uh, other matters demanding our attention and our dollars here at home on Earth. Uh, it may be that in a few years we'll look back on this and wonder how we could have ever questioned uh, this investment, even as I suppose there was some uh, chagrin, uh, there was some chagrin in uh, Spain when they wondered why they questioned $75,000 to send Columbus to America. Yes. Or the, how many million dollars was it this country spent for the purchase of Alaska, the Seaward's Folly, about a hundred years ago? Yeah. Thank you very much, Arthur. I expect to be talking to you many more times during the next eight days when I'll have the privilege of having you with us on these uh, broadcasts. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Arthur Clark, the distinguished uh, uh, science fiction writer and historian and world traveler. You never know where Arthur is going to show up next around the world. Uh, we talked earlier about the, uh, the possibility of any delay. It was mentioned mostly by, I think, uh, uh, our meteorologist in New York, Mr. Clark, who uh, uh, 
talking about. <laughs> in New York, our weather, weather, we're out meteorologist. <clears throat> Let's all go home. It's only uh, 21 more minutes to the launch. We have time to recover, perhaps. Our meteorologist, Gordon Barnes, in New York, said a little earlier that uh, the weather might deteriorate here this afternoon, as it does frequently in Florida this time of the year in the afternoon with uh, thunderstorms. And as a matter of fact, there is a rather heavy cloud layer building up right now outside our window there that could uh, uh, perhaps give us a little trouble with our cameras in watching the launch once they get to that uh, 2,500 to 3,000 foot level where that first layer of cloud seems to be.